IQ Smart Parent is made possible in part by the McCune Foundation and the Grable Foundation. If you think science, technology, engineering, and math education are only for the classroom, think again. Today, we're uncovering unique STEM activities in some very unexpected places. Oh my gosh, it's it! <laughs> we'll take you from the side of a stream bank to a typical toy room transformed into one fantastic maker space. And we'll show you how technology is changing your child's phys ed class at school. That's all coming up on this episode of IQ Smart Parent, and it starts right now. Welcome to IQ Smart Parent. I'm your host, Darius Chisholm. We know parents are always looking for that perfect teachable moment. And that's what this episode is all about, finding STEM in strange places. We will reveal activities that build invaluable skills and they're so much fun, your kids will be begging you to do them daily. Let's kick things off by heading outside to meet a group of Girl Scouts. They're learning how to be citizen scientists and, as you'll see, they leave no stone unturned in their efforts. Dip your toes into the wet and wonderful world of a stream girl. Oh, oh there's a bunch of bugs on there. Ooh, there you go. Look at that one. And then there's Ooh, a look at him go. They're so fast. Oh, but this program title is more than just a clever mashup to talk about learning STEM concepts in a stream. STREAM stands for Science, Technology, Recreation, Engineering, Arts, and Math. Caddis will make a tiny little house for STREAM Girls exists thanks to a unique partnership between Girl Scouts USA and Trout Unlimited. That's a national nonprofit dedicated to conserving cold water fisheries. Okay, pick them up. Because what we want to do is kind of look in here. You never know what's in here until you start inspecting. This is the first ever Stream Girl program, and it's being held in northeastern Pennsylvania. Hopes are high for many more to come because these educators believe the best way to make the learning real is to make the learning real hands on. I did. Oh my gosh, that's it. <laughs> a textbook is so one dimensional. It's words, it's pictures on paper. It, it doesn't give you the smells, the touch, the feel, the, the look, the sense of the, the air around you. Yeah. 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 I got one. Oh, I got two. Oh, I see it. Oh, oh, get it. Multiple scientific studies show hands on activities stimulate different parts of kids' brains. The more parts of the brain that you use, the more likely you are to retain information. It's way more fun than a book, that's for sure. Wild trout thrive in only the coldest, cleanest waters. The girls are assessing this tributary of the Susquehanna River to see if it's healthy enough to support trout and its food source. I got it all. You did? Yeah. What, what's it look like? like? It's one of those really tiny bugs again. Really? The three indicators that we're looking for in a stream for good health are mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. And their scientific names then spell E-P-T, and that's what you're gonna look at for stream health. Is there anything in the green bucket? A white bucket. Can we just scoop some clear water? Just for some extra. When you tell a child to pick up a rock and really look at it, you normally get, they look at the rock and they toss the rock, and they look at a rock and they toss the rock. But what I really love is when they look at the rock and they stare at it because they're really intent. They're, they want to find something, and that, that search for knowledge is really a great thing to see. The real thing is so much better. You get to touch it and see it and like hold it in your hand. It's just a whole different experience. You learn so much, like get outside, experience as much as you can. According to the mission statement on the Girl Scouts USA website, they strive to offer fun with purpose. Activities like this inspire girls to embrace scientific discovery in their lives. 
You guys are finding some nice small things. That's really good. What is that? I'm not going to tell you. You've got to figure it out. Uh, you got to figure it out. For Trout Unlimited, the goal is to get girls to appreciate that every person is a citizen of her watershed. Watersheds support wildlife and human activity, but they are threatened by development, pollution, and climate change. If the water is unhealthy for wildlife, odds are it's not healthy for humans either. We're a small part of a much bigger picture. Opening them up to more and more ideas about how to incorporate the conservation message with their life. And that just builds a much more rounded individual. Look at his eyes. He's got the larger eyes in the front. All right, and that helps him with his vision to hunt. Now look at he's taking up a stance. Look at that. Trying to make himself look big to get away from me. The learning skills and the education side of the fun that we did today was that they were doing the scientific method. They took a guess on whether this was good quality stream. They went out, they observed, they collected the data, they analyzed the data by counting the, the species, uh, and then they made their assumption based on that. Especially if you're looking at come on. At the end of the two-day program, they'll earn a Stream Girls badge for completing eight core activities, exploring the watershed as scientists, anglers, and artists. If you don't have the value range correct in the beginning, then it's all just kind of be medium. I think incorporating the arts really helps kids as they're learning the science. You can take snapshots and that's good, but if you can slow down enough to Im immerse yourself and really look, really observe, and try to capture what you see, that makes the experience much more memorable. Mayflies that have been working out at the gym. <laughs> okay, that's kind of what they look like. Those skills come in handy once the scouts exit the stream and identify the macro invertebrates they collected. We never shy away from using scientific terminology with the girls. We break the word down to words that they would understand, macro being bigger, invertebrate, non backbone. This big turd is called a dichotomous key. A dichotomous key. And then we identified the critters using that dichotomous key. And then we use that identification and counting of the species to look at the stream health. So it's a step-by-step -step process. Three pairs of legs are 10 plus legs. We made the connection between the scientific terminology that we're teaching them and what we want them to learn by the hands-on activity. Isn't it cool how it looks like a mini lobster? These are the three critters that are going to tell us really good water quality, okay? And we found two of the three. So do you think we have good water quality and, or really bad water quality? We actually have pretty good water quality because not only did we find two of the three different species, we found a lot of them. Afterwards, the critters are released unharmed and the stream girls record their findings in science journals. We want to tell them, these are important areas and we need to conserve them. But then at the end of what they do, we want it to be their own discovery and knowledge that says, there is a reason I want to conserve this. Because if you just tell them that they have to conserve it, you're not going to make a conservationist. You're not going to make a steward of the environment. You need them to want to do that. I want them to form a memory of nature that they're going to cherish. A great big room filled with building blocks. That might be every kid's dream, right? Now imagine that room is actually at their school and those toys are being used right alongside the textbooks. That's what's happening at Montour Elementary School in Western Pennsylvania, home to the nation's very first brick maker space, powered by Lego Education. And here to talk about it are Amanda McDermott, Justin Alio, and Jason Burek. Thank you so much for being here on the show today. Thank you for yes. having us. So Amanda, let's start with you. So uh, certainly as a STEAM teacher and Lego master teacher, you know, you're busy with all of your kids, but they're using these Legos not as a toy, but more in educational purposes. How's it working out? It's great. I mean, our students and teachers in our building have really embraced the whole playful learning idea. And 
I mean, what kid doesn't want to come to school where they're getting to have fun learning? And I think that's the most important piece to it, is we want to spark our kids' interest and keep them excited and engaged. And what better way to do it than with some Lego bricks? You call it playful learning. That's mm -hmm. a great phrase. Well, I can't take credit for it. That's, you know, Lego education is, that's their whole idea. And that's why they do what they do. So Justin, when we look at this, it's very interesting because it's getting kids away from typical textbooks, right? And so in this case, how is this really helping students with learning? Well, we want schools to be relevant, we want it to be engaging, but we also want students to love and get excited about learning. And learning comes in so many different forms and it's a, really a lifelong skill learning. So with Lego, we try to do a lot of innovative best practices with it, and using Legos. For example, I have this Lego brick right here. Just this four by two Lego brick, if you take six of them, you can do over 900 million combinations with just six of these bricks. So imagine 900 million. 900 million. Wow. <laughs> so imagine a room like the Brick Maker Space, powered by Lego Education Solutions at Montour, where you have you know thousands of these Lego bricks, and you have an animation studio where students make movies. You have a test track where students design and build cars to go down to. You have an engineering station and a collaboration station in the middle where students learn math, art, science, so many different activities. And the cool thing is, right in the middle of this space, our students at Steam Camp built a replica model of our school using Legos. So it's an exciting process. It has we're, to we're, be yeah, exciting. Absolutely. And Jason, you've watched it unfold there at your school. I mean, in this case, well, how are the kids uh, responding to learning in this makerspace? Oh, they love it. They love it. I mean, that's what gets me excited uh, to see their passion and excitement. Uh, they don't even realize they're learning more in that room. And that, that's one reason we designed that room. Yeah. You know, it's a big part of the school. Great. So let's dive in and talk about some of the projects that you brought. Amanda, you want to share with what, what we have here? Sure. Um, part of our building in our room, we have a, um, an architecture station. So there we have you know, some of the world's iconic buildings and they have kits and the kids can follow the directions through the book or online and build some of, you know, we have an Eiffel Tower. So they're using that to follow the guide there. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, in that guide there's hundreds of pages of directions and it really teaches kids A, that there is a process to do things and they have to be mindful when they're putting things together and kind of just really collaboration and we focus on the communication. If you're working in a team and trying to put a piece like that together, it's going to take a lot of communication. Now there's a car that's sitting there and it's not just mm -hmm. obviously designed from Lego, but it moves. <laughs> right, that's our friend Milo, our friendly robot Milo. Um, that's actually a WeDo 2.0 kit and in that kit, again, there are plenty of directions that the students can follow and then they can go ahead and build on to that. So it's, they're not limited with just the parts that they have in front of them. And then we can bring in the computer piece and they can actually code the robot to do things. So if you look here, we have our um, Milo here. I just wrote some simple code for him and we can have him move. There are sensors that go along oh, with it. Milo found a flower. <laughs> Let's he, investigate further. He can talk to you and then the kids can go ahead and change that code as they get used to it, they can make it their own. This is very fascinating. Mm -hmm. You have a few other items that are here, so let's move through those. Sure. Well, if you want to talk about Heinz Field for a second, sure. uh, I <laughs> built this piece uh, a few years ago, and it took about a month. There's 3,500 pieces uh, in the Lego Heinz Field. Uh, I also have a smaller version, and I like teaching kids at our, at our summer camp about building skill. You know, there's different size models and, and the purpose of models. Um, but use pictures. Of course, I went down the Heinz Field, took a lot of pictures. It's fascinating. You did a really, really nice job. And you said it, you. about a month? Yeah, it took about a month. Yeah. And yeah. not to mention... I just... didn't count the hours, though. <laughs> never count the hours. When so you it really the... could have been a lot more than oh, yeah. that, right? Yeah. 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 But you've been, you've been handling Legos most of your life, right? Yes. Yeah, so this comes very natural to you. And so when you see the trends, that just the, the change in terms of it's not just playing, but when we're incorporating coding, and, and mm -hmm. it really has taken this to another level. Right. You could pretty much build anything your imagination allows. You know, that's what I always loved about Legos. So you built shoes for your wife? Do I understand? I did. I, did. I don't know how happy she was about that. To be honest, were they but, comfortable? Well, that's the problem. That is the problem. Uh, they were comfortable until I put the Lego blocks on. Um, but I gave them the for a Christmas gift. But then when we had the grand opening uh, for the brick maker space, I said, now is the perfect time to wear them. And she came through. Yeah. She wore them in the, uh, 
And the president of Lego Education was greatly impressed. Oh, so, well, yeah. that was very nice of you, yes. I'm sure, <laughs> even though she may have, you know, been a little uncomfortable. Right. <laughs> yep. uh, so when we really think about, like, children, this is all fascinating, and it, it looks like there's a lot of time and commitment, but for kids that are maybe just starting, and they don't, they see this and they think, I can't do that, what would be some s beginner steps that you might recommend? Right, one thing I always recommend um, is start with the kids, mm -hmm. like Amanda talked about. But then to progress, you could build uh, a replica of your house. You know, that's a fun family project. Go outside, take measurements of the house, take some pictures of the house, and you could build that as a family. You know, that, that's a nice way to start. And then I love sports. That's why I got into the stadium building. Um, but just give it a try. Don't be scared to fail. Uh, we have a growth mindset at Montour, so we try to encourage that thinking in kids. You, know, you may not always get it right the first time, but it doesn't mean you give up. Yeah. And what 21st century skills do you think that kids are really gaining from this? I think Amanda said, I think collaboration and mm -hmm. also creativity, mm -hmm. a lot of design thinking skills go into this. And I want to talk about what Jason said and getting the parents involved. I mean, Lego's been around for 60 years and it's really intergenerational. Well, it's interesting because we uh, took advantage of the Legos and actually created a little dolly for our camera, <laughs> which I thought was so cool to come in here. So uh, I think James is going to come in and, and help us out here so we can actually see this in action. And I mean, as we can see, it was well built, but the camera's on there and we're going to um, make it go for us. <laughs> and the cool thing about this is this was something that we made for a specific use. It's functional, it works. We can use this and it goes to show that you can really create some functional uh, prototypes. We can use them to build prototypes, we can use the design process and work through, and we know that using a design process, they're never done. So even if you end up with a functional tool, you can always make it better and always add to it. When students learn about circuits, for instance, mm -hmm. um, now we take it to the next level. They'll build a, a house, mm -hmm. and then they actually put the circuit in the house and light it up, so now you have lights in your rooms. So another fantastic lesson on the solar system, and students built models of the solar system out of Legos. So just a natural fit. Whatever you can imagine. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being here. This was fascinating, and, and we're really glad that you were able to bring some of the examples. So thank you so much. Need a little more inspiration to build STEAM education into family activities? We've got you covered with these great tips. Raise independent thinkers by turning everyday activities into STEM challenges. Provide different sized containers during bath time so kids can measure water and experiment with volume. Build observation and estimation skills by asking kids to guess how many pasta noodles are in a bag or how many candies fit in a jar. On the road, let kids chart the route to your destination. Provide materials so kids can plan and build an obstacle course in the backyard. And finally, Encourage kids to create their own board game and play it at the next family game night. No doubt about it, technology is changing the way kids learn in the classroom, but it's also changing the way they stay fit in phys ed classes. Welcome to our next guest, Joanne Light, the chair of the Physical and Health Education Department at Slippery Rock University in Pennsylvania. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Now, I can remember phys ed classes being, you know, running outside, mm -hmm. playing dodgeball, being very physical. But of sure. course, with technology, it's changed the way that kids are experiencing phys ed. How so? Oh, most definitely. Technology has energized physical education. It's made it exciting and accessible for children of all ages. It allows the, the teacher of the 21st century to combine the whole body and mind concept into total wellness, and technology helps us to do that. Well, you know, it, some parents may think, but wait a second, that means kids are sitting down and they're looking at their cell phones or on a laptop. That's not being physical. How is it still encouraging physical activity? It's encouraging physical activity because there's so many ways that we can get up and move, even though we might be looking at a device or looking at a screen. We might be able to do some type of competition like a Wii event, like extra gaming. We might be able to use an app on a smart device to learn new exercises or new activities. So technology doesn't have to be either technology or movement. It can be a synergistic relationship between physical uh, activity and, and movement. Yeah, even making their own exercise videos. Exactly. Students now 
t kids know how to use all those devices. They have a smartphone. They just make a video of them exercising, make a video of them doing some type of athletic skill, and it's a great way to use technology. And I would imagine there was a generation that, that really got this. I mean, obviously, there was a time when kids were primarily playing with their devices, but now with this encouragement to be more physical, it has become sec second nature to them, perhaps. It has, for sure. And, and as I train future teachers, they all come in with this technology background, so it makes it a lot easier to train the future teachers how to teach using technology because all the ch children have devices. How do you see this growing into the future and, and are there other ways or things that we just haven't begun to implement? There's always new technology being explored. Uh, the gymnasium is not always the first place people think to use it, but we find ways to use devices, we find ways to use all sorts of technology. Um, our, our goal as physical educators is to move more and that we found technology that helps us to do that. And in the future, whatever the new technology might be, we'll find a way to, to encourage movement and use it in our classrooms. And this is something that we're seeing teachers uh, and educators do nationwide. Most definitely. Yeah. All across the country, physical educators are using their smart device to take attendance, to record videos, to show videos, to uh, do assessments, to flip the classroom, to use heart rate monitors, Fitbits, anything to track movement and get, get kids active. So yes, definitely. And is this tied into national education standards? Most definitely. We have standards as any other discipline does. And if we can use technology to help address those, those national standards to meet the needs of our students, we definitely are doing that. Now, let's go back to this moment uh, that we talked about in terms of making videos and, sure. and doing that. But, but beyond that, it seems that kids can really get creative and to maybe even market those videos. I mean, this really brings in oh, yes. a great deal of right. uh, a future involvement and interdisciplinary things. Interdisciplinary is huge in, our, in, in what we do in physical education. And um, so they do the media in the lower ages, even the elementary kids know how to create videos and, and we do interdisciplinary lessons with, with technology and spelling and, and counting and, and uh, math and letters and colors. And, um, but yes, definitely, the, the kids all know how to use technology, so we use it in our classrooms. And that's called action-based action -based learning? learning, mm -hmm. exactly. And we've discovered that the kids learn better through movement. So. Um, not only are we doing interdisciplinary lessons in our gymnasiums, which helps the classroom teachers with test scores, and they, they love that, but we also teach the classroom teachers how to incorporate what are called brain breaks. We like to call them brain boosts because when the kids sit for a long time period, they can't learn. And so the research shows that if the kids get up every 30 minutes, every hour, you have some type of activity with a partner by themselves, two, three minutes, they get up, they move, they sit back down, they concentrate better, they focus better, they, they learn better, they recall. And so brain breaks are a great thing that we can teach our elementary school teachers, even the high school teachers to do, get kids up and moving when they're outside of physical education class. And how do you teach phys ed uh, teachers uh, and educators to use QR codes? QR codes are wonderful. Um, if they have any type of device, some schools are bring your own device, BYOD. And even if you don't, if you just have a few in the classroom, you scan the QR code, it can take you to a video that you can view of an activity that you might need to perform in class. It could be a clue for a scavenger hunt. So you're moving to get to the next clue. And uh, there's a lot of ways you can use Q QR co co codes in our classroom. And yes. does technology level the playing field for kids that maybe aren't naturally physically gifted or, or might even be challenged in some way? Technology is a great tool to engage every child um, because when we went to school, we played volleyball, basketball, and softball, and not everybody likes that. And we missed all the kids who needed to move or who wanted to move in a different way. So the technology allows us to incorporate um, individualized instruction. It could be an app, it could be extra gaming, it could just be a, a video of, of Zumba or yoga that a child wants to perform. So, so know what the kid likes, find their passion, and then find the technology that complements it. And I understand you've also incorporated the use of heart monitors. Heart rate monitors are wonderful because you teach the children how to exercise in their target zone so they know that it's beneficial. And usually the kids who, who dislike the heart rate monitors are the really good athletes because now they actually have to work to get into that zone. Mm -hmm. And the kid that you thought might not be working so hard is really working pretty pretty hard. How do parents really take this with their the kids are learning in school, in their phys ed classes, around technology, and encourage more movement at home? That's a great question. You could, um, as they do their homework, do a brain break. Set a timer on the device and, and, and do a brain break, a brain boost, some type of activity. 
You could um, Google new activities. If you're watching the, the Olympics and you see something that your child might be interested in, you could Google it, find out where you could maybe do that in the community. If your child likes to be outside, you can find apps that in, uh, where they could do geocaching or hiking in the community or find a disc golf course. Um, lots of different ways that you can incorporate it. As a family, you could do a Google Calendar where each person will add something to the calendar that involves physical activity that you can do as a family, whether it's walk the dog around the block, use your app to, to, to route your bicycle ride, things like that. Yeah, get creative and have get fun doing it. Get creative and have fun doing it. Yeah. Just move and, and the technology can be a nice complement to that. Great, great. Well, thank you so much, Thank Joanne. you. We appreciate you being here. And we're here to help you raise curious and capable kids. And we hope today's guests have inspired you to look for STEM activities in unexpected places in your own home and in your community. Get moving, have fun, and join us again next time for more IQ Smart Parent. Want to learn more about IQ Smart Parent? Visit us online at iqsmartparent.org for more episodes and additional tools and resources. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest to share your thoughts on being a 21st century parent. IQ Smart Parent is made possible in part by the McCune Foundation and the Grable Foundation.